Almost like we planned it. <laughs> Almost like we planned it. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, yep. It, just like last night, it's it's Basil again wanting me to to, to remind me that I need to. Uh, and even though Progressive Soup's been on the air for over eight years, and Basil Buddha Cat presents, it's been on the air five years. Basil has this crazy notion that he actually got me my gig even though I've been on the air three years more than he has. So um, explain that one away, Kat. That's, that's the best I could do. Sorry, Basil. OK. Welcome to Progressive Soup. My name is David Stevenson. I'm tonight's host. And back for a return engagement from last night, Manuela Palmares. And last night we talked a lot about, we talked about a lot of different things, including <laughs> including running for office, uh, including uh, the great history of Danbury as a great, great cultural place of immigration, where immigrants have come here for decades and uh, just made Danbury into a, just a marvelous city. What we didn't talk about enough was Tribuna. Mm -hmm. And for you, for you folks that haven't heard of Tribuna, it's a marvelous newspaper. It is, well, Basil would say it's the newspaper of all newspapers. Wow, I like Basil. <laughs> because, because every article that they run, they run in three separate languages, English, Spanish, and Portuguese. So one of the side benefits of that is you can certainly read the article, and the articles are all good, by the way. They're all very interesting. But you can read the article in your principal language and then you can read it in one of the other two languages, or even both of the other two languages, and pick up a little knowledge about translation from English to Portuguese, Portuguese to Spanish, Portuguese to English. Now, it, it's, it, it's a great self-learning tool. Sort of like picking up the guitar and, and knowing what to do a little bit, so you can get started. Mm -hmm. The Tribuna. Yes, the brainchild of my mother. In what way? She, she's the, it's her idea? Yeah, my mom founded the newspaper 17 years ago with my sister, and um, we've been at it as a family for that long. So most of my adult life, it's been, Tribuna is like my fourth sibling. So it's, <laughs> it has a life of its own. <laughs> And um, it's, it's more than just a newspaper, it's more than just a business for us. And it really came for her idea to kind of bring people around the table at the same time. And understanding that whether you got here a day ago or you got here 20 years ago, you shouldn't have language be the barrier between getting information about where you chose to live. Um, and we felt that there was a real lack of information within the immigrant community on how to live in the United States and a lot of questions from people who were raised and born here about immigrants coming into their communities. And we felt the Tribuna was a space that we can kind of bring those two worlds together simultaneously. That is, that's, that's pretty interesting. And, and, and as I say, I, I, I began reading it a couple months ago and I'm just, the articles are, are very fascinating and they're, and they're generic day-to-day -day articles on, I, I would liken it in a sense to the Reader's Digest, an old periodical where you have right. articles that, that are how-to articles, articles, you Funny know. Funny you mention that because it is one of the publications that we looked at. Right when we were starting all this oh, seventeen years yeah. ago, okay. and we we chose the medium of a newspaper because it was less uh, pretentious than a magazine, right? Um, but we really treat ourselves editorially more like a magazine. 
So sometimes people expect the Tribune to act like a newspaper, right? Which it doesn't, it, of course. Yeah, and they have this pressure of like, why aren't you like the News Times? Why aren't you out there covering this event and doing this and that? You know, we may be in that format, but that's not who we are. Yes. And we already have the Newsless Times. I <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, Cop we... Copyright. <laughs> but Continue. our goal really is to be a medium that functions like a magazine, mm -hmm. but that people from the immigrant community will feel comfortable holding and carrying and taking with, you know, home and, and sharing. Um, you know, like, the best way to describe it is one day I was driving around Danbury before I had to go to, to Brewster to catch a train to go to the city. Yeah. And there was a guy at Kennedy Park reading the Tribuna. I get into my car, I drive to Brewster, and someone in the train going to New York that was not a day laborer was reading the paper. So it's having a very broad outreach. Yeah, and it was well, a Danbury resident that worked in Westchester uh, that picked up the paper because his wife was Brazilian, mm -hmm. you know. So um, that's why we created the Tribuna, because then you have all these people reading the same news. Now, for instance, our latest issue, we have a wonderful story about um, what's the stress now on immigrant families over the new immigration policies. Yeah. And we interviewed Judge Diane Yaman, our judge of probate, yep. who has been spearheading this effort of educating the community on um, temporary guardianship uh, so that people understand how to be a standby guardian and have a standby guardian available in case there's a dual deportation um, you know, aspect where <laughs> both Quick shout out to Diane Yemen and her husband Bob, who's um, we've had a, tr a lot of real estate closings with. But uh, go ahead, continue. Yeah, so they, so we, we did an article really doing the breakdown of what, it, why is this an issue, right? Because I have to think of both readers, a non-immigrant and an immigrant. Mm -hmm. Why is this an issue? And then if it is an issue for you, yeah. Here's literally the actual steps of establishing the standby guardianship. And if you need the kit that Governor Malloy created, here's the link to the kit so that you can download this actual uh, uh, you know, ap the application to do so. So we see ourselves with a lot of um, social responsibility that if we raise an issue, are we also, together with the raising of the issue, providing enough tools for the person to navigate that on their own and try to find their own solution to that problem? Um, you know, at the same time, I wrote an editorial about some of the ice raids we've had recently yeah. and really posting a question to the immigrant community, will we protest every deportation, even when it's of someone that committed a crime against someone in our own community? Because if which which, uh, which I, I, I tend to think is probably almost never, but you're right that, that none of our jobs is to, is to defend the guilty. Well, in, in the case of what happened, you know, mm. this, this person had already admitted guilt in molesting a 14-year-old child who was also Ecuadorian. Mm -hmm. So where do we draw the line here? Yeah. Where is the social justice for our, our own Ecuadorian children, if you want to think about it in those terms, you know? So focus on defending the, uh, focus on defending the folks that we know I literally said this. Are, are, absolutely, are absolutely innocent people that are only here because they want it there, because they're Americans in training. I literally said this. Call me and I'll be out on the street whenever the guy or the girl or the woman or the man who was in the wrong place at the wrong time and got stopped and was deported and was a working man, a working a mother, a working father and has no criminal record. That's injustice, right? I've been in that position. You know, I know what that is like. Yeah, you talked about that in the, the first show about yeah, how Yeah, we how were about undocumented. You, undocumented. Yeah, and, and for a number of years. I mean, it on, took only by the grace of God that it was then instead of now. Well, things could be very different and even even back then, you, it the sounds danger, like the danger was almost the same though. Like those those of us have lived in that situation, mm -hmm. we know that also there is the shadow of social media yeah. that may look like we're having more of it. Mm -hmm. But I remember a lot more deportations between the, the years of two thousand and six and two thousand and eleven than I remember them happening now. But a lot there's a lot more video of them now, a lot yeah. more pictures of them now going around. But I remember a case of Teresa Pereira. Um, who was a Danbury resident who was taken away by ICE in front of her two children. Her son was the star of the Danbury track team in high school. Her and her husband were taken. Um, a local attorney who did a great job was her, was her attorney. I followed the case throughout for six months until she got to be in front of an immigration judge. And um, there was no one on the street. 
No one went out on the street for Teresa. It wasn't sexy. It wasn't, you know. And That's perhaps, perhaps the greatest sin of today's, or, you know, it's not just today. I mean, you go back to the, uh, to the eight, late 1800s, early 1900s, mm -hmm. you have um, um, uh, uh, Havana Harbor, right. Remem remember the right. Maine, right. you know, and, and, th and you had yellow dog journalism. Mm -hmm. You had all the things that are wrong with the media today are probably the same things that and were wrong the with the media. And even people in the community. Always. There, there are your, 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 your true warriors. Like, like there, there are some people that, hey, I made different with them in a number of issues, mm -hmm. but I will never take away the fact that Lynn Tabersack has always stood up for the American community. You know what I'm saying? Like, that, she's always been there my for hero. that community. My she's hero. She's always been. She's my... The, the, the we, know, we disagree in maybe like 90% of all yeah. possible things, yeah. but that's someone who's always straight true to the cause. However, um, I know no one stood up at that time. And that was a case of great injustice. Mm -hmm. For you to watch a 17-year-old tell an immigration judge in Hartford, I know that this country was built on this concept that I can pursue my happiness. You said that in your Declaration of Independence. How can I be happy without my mom? And you're in that room and you're hearing that. You know, like, it's visceral. Like you, you feel the injustice of the immigration system. You'd have, to, you'd have to be dead not to feel it. And most people that don't understand it and have a hard line on it mm -hmm. don't understand how broken it is and how it's everybody's fault. Like it's the Democratic Party's fault, it's the Republican Party's fault. Everybody had a finger in it in making it the mess that it is. And it's not a fair system. It's a system built in a way to make it the hardest possible way for you to become legal to then, in some sort of magical way, figure out quality, and right? It, and, like, it and it didn't used to be that way. My, it, my, my parents, my grandparents, came here from Ireland, 1906. Mm -hmm. And they got off the boat at Ellis Island mm -hmm. and uh, did the compulsory, quick physical mm -hmm. checkup. Mm -hmm. um, and they had somebody there from the Warburg Estate in Greenwich. Mm -hmm. Hi, well, we're here waiting for you. Bang! They were in, and they were in, and they never had a worry about. And some it. people would argue they came in the right way, right? No, <laughs> they came in exactly the same well, way as people some, coming in now. But some people would argue they came yeah. in the right way, you but know. It, but it's only because the the rules have changed exactly so dramatically to the to the harshest. Uh, you know, one of my biggest frustrations, you know, when when McCain, when uh, Senator McCain was running against President Obama in the b early stages of his campaign, mm -hmm. he had one of the most comprehensive and compassionate immigration reform plans yes, I had ever did. heard of for a long time. Yes, he did. That included people paying a fine for already be here, and if they couldn't pay that fine monetarily, they had to do something like five thousand hours of community service in their community. So they were building community, they were building relationships, they were, um, you know, crossing some cultural lines in order for them to really find out, like, you know, the love for their community and give something back. You know, and then something happened, I don't know, I think he slipped in his bathroom and hit his head, and then he gave up on that plan. John McCain has been so you know, good, so good in so many cases, and, and like you say, sometimes he just... And then he switches. He, he, he loses his way suddenly, and... Yeah, so we, you know, we, we've seen this go back and forth through the mm -hmm. hands of so many people. Mm -hmm. So the only thing that we've tried to remain stable on is, how do we as a newspaper, as a media, provide this community the information that they need in order to understand these things and mm -hmm. make their own decision mm -hmm. um, yeah. and be as unbiased as possible. So for instance, our political reporting is a partnership with the Connecticut Mirror, yep. um, in which is then a, um, you know, a brother or sister of NPR, of WNPR here in Connecticut, owned by the same media company, a non-profit news site that covers the capital in a very, um, you know, I think in a very fair way, right? So that's where we get our articles about Hartford from. Um, you know, we do a lot of the articles original from us. We have a lot of contributors. Um, we have a partnership with the Embry Public School Systems about child development. They, they came to us and said, we have a problem. We're having a hard time having engagement in the Latino community in our school system. We said, we're going to give you a column. And you talk to them because I can't talk for you. A lot of people think the solution is have a tribute and do a story. I'm like, no. You take ownership of this issue and you talk to them directly because they should listen from you. They should hear from you. Um, we had a great partnership with Dale. They were like, we don't have enough children from the Latino community enrolling. Dale being? The uh, Danbury Youth and Sports Association. Mm -hmm. 
And I, I hate acronyms. That's, <laughs> why I, that's why when I ever hear an acronym, I need sure. to know. I need to sure. hear it. Not for my and they run, they run but for the, the audience's edification. Sure. They run the, the little football league. The, you know, they run the cheerleading program. They have track and field teams. You know, really sports that if you're from South and Central America, you can go like, what is this? Like your kid comes up with an application like, you're not playing American football. That's not real football. Soccer is real football. I'm like, football. Not football. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Football. Oh, yeah. Or, or, in this, or in the case of the, the term political football, yeah. you'd have to use the term political football. Yeah, exactly. So a kid comes home and they really want to be a part of something, but their parents don't get it. And they're like, no, you're not. So we started giving them this okay. column. Parents. <laughs> Right? They get in the way of childhood so often. Oh. We, we started giving them the space for this column. And within a year's time, uh, explaining the rules of football, explaining the benefits of cheerleading, explaining like, beyond just what the stereotype was, 30% yep. increase in enrollment of people from the Latino community. Excellent. And children coming with their parents, translating for their parents, and showing up for tryouts. So we, we look at this from both angles. We feel that it's a parallel street. We feel that the immigrant community has a lot to give, but also a lot to learn. And that puts the Tribune in a very unique place yeah. that is um, uncomfortable at times. But as a journalist, I think that's exactly how I should make people feel uncomfortable. Only through being uncomfortable can you find a, a greater level of comfort, it seems yeah. like. Yeah, and then in the process, we also needed to find the right way to have more of a philanthropic role in, in Danbury. And that's when my mom decided to create the New American Dream Foundation that we have. And um, for the past three years, we host a gala that's gone from 200 people to 400 people at the Amber Room. Explain what that is. The New American Dream Foundation, we give out scholarships to immigrants or children of immigrants. Um, that send us an essay about what's their American dream, what they had to overcome to achieve it, and w what are they doing their way. We also give a scholarship to a veteran who's joined the military um, before becoming a citizen or is an immigrant, a naturalized immigrant that's joined the military. And then we also give a award to a person of the year who is an adult that doesn't have an academic goal but could use $2,000. So um, we put out the applications in, in the community. They can go to our website to fill out an application. And we have a committee that reads through them. And in September, we reveal the winners. And um, we have 10 finalists. They all get to go to this big gala. And it's just like the Oscars. We reveal the winners at the actual dinner. And they get a big statue, yeah, a check. Yeah. Um, you know, and they're recognized for just putting a face to the immigration issue and showing us the real purpose of why people are here. What was the dream that they were after? And the website is? The New American Dream Foundation dot org. Mm -hmm. And how about the, the uh, website for Tribuna? It's tribunact dot com. Tribuna CT, very important to yeah. get those Connecticut, the Tribuna CT in there. Tribuna dot com. And in both websites, you're going to find information. Um, and I just think that I invite the community to go to the gala to support the foundation, um, help us be able to give out these scholarships. And uh, we've, we've been able to, so far, donate over $62,000 in three years to the community. And I'm sure that money goes all goes to a, some some very worthy individuals. It does. We had a breakfast recently to kick off this year, mm -hmm. and one of our winners was Angelica Crispo, who was a Danbury High School student, and she's going to Westcon now. And she saw she's an American citizen, but saw her father be deported in front of her when she was eight years old here in Danbury, <sighs> and she never really felt comfortable telling that story. How do you want to just? How do you? How do you? process something like that happening when you're eight years old. And, and that's what she told us in her essay. And that's why we could not, ha not have chosen Angelica. Because she said, I, would, I saw my mother become a single parent without wanting to be one, by no fault of her own, having to raise all me and my siblings, coming back with swollen feet and swollen hands from working so much to, to make up for my dad's income. And I knew that the best thing I could do is go to school and do good at school even though I had to translate for her, even though I had to also watch my siblings. And she tells a story that's a very common story in our community. But she really didn't feel like she could talk about it publicly until someone nudged her to put in an application. And once she did put in the application, we were all so moved by her story. And um, we gave her the scholarship. So um, this year she talked at the breakfast and said that Beyond the money, the confidence that she got from being able to tell her story, understand that it had an impact in the community, was really the biggest um, thing that she got out of it. So. Okay. Now, uh, 
Joe over here at the table asked, asked to hear the, the website again. It's tribunact.com. Yes. T-R-I-B-U-N-A, that's the name of the paper. Yeah. Tribunact.com. And, and the other one is the the New American Dream Foundation. New American Dream Foundation. Dot org. So dot org. the New American Dream Foundation. Dot org. Okay, so it's got the in mm -hmm. there. Of mm -hmm. course, now if you Google American Dream Foundation, you're probably gonna, yes. you'll probably find it. You will, you will. And we have a Facebook page that's very easy to find. Um, and there you're gonna see some videos. There's a video of Angelica Crespo giving that testimony. Um, you know, and it's been it's been actually one of my favorite things ever to do during the year. It's putting this gala together and seeing WestCon as a major sponsor right next to Banana Brazil. You know, both having the same corporate sign. And when you go to the gala, the beautiful thing is that you see Danbury for what it is. You see everyone that's invited, and you see the diversity of our city in a ballroom. And I do a lot of the chicken circuit. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I mean, I've had chicken in so many different ways between the Ethan Allen, the Ember Room, and what have you. And sometimes you don't get to see that. You don't see the same Danbury in that ballroom. And now, it always comes back, doesn't it always come back down to food? Yes. And, and aside from the rubber chicken circuit mm. and, Ethan, and, 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 and Ethan Allen and these folks, the, these, the places that have, you know, yeah. the, the kind of processed dinners yeah. that they hand out to about 3,000 people or 100 people at one time, that, that, which is passable as food, Danbury has some of the most amazing restaurants in the world by dint of being such a diverse community. Yeah. And you mentioned Banana Brazil uh -huh. as one of the great ones. Uh, there's, a, 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 uh, there's an Ecuadorian restaurant down toward the end in South... La Mitad del Mundo, uh, there's the, Los the Incas. Mitad del Mundo, Las, Las Incas, yeah, there's... Yes. Um, um, Los uh, Andes. Uh, uh, Las Americas. There is Las that's Americas. My, that's my particular favorite. There's Padaminas. Padaminas, they, yeah. yeah. There's so many of them, and um, it's one of the things I love about our city. Like we can just walk around and and really feel everybody's culture by just you know sharing a dish with them, and and it's just been you know I I love Danbury, and I think that there's just so much promise. We are good, great. We're a great city, but there's so much promise, and I think that's why it's so important to be involved whether it's politically, whether it's socially, um, whether it's just by doing your part, by taking a Saturday to walk downtown and go to one of the restaurants and try some of these foods. And, um, and if you have a hard time communicating, bring your phone and try some you know, Google Translate or something, but don't give up um, and try it because um, you're going to be surprised. We're, we're pretty cool. No, I've been in Las Americas, and, and they have the television, and of course it's uh, Telemundo. Uh -huh. So it's got, so you, you have everything in Spanish. Uh -huh. And it's, it's intriguing to watch how Telemundo, the, the comparison between Telemundo and uh, your, more, your more, traditional, uh, more traditional television stations. Mm -hmm. Very similar and yet a little bit different. Yeah, there's, there's definitely an editorial um, distinction. You know, the delivery may feel like the same, but you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good way to see the difference. But you know, Nowadays, if you look at cable news, like, can you really tell the difference? You know, like, it's... <laughs> Probably not. Probably. You know, like, it's been... It's the other thing, too. We, we have become so divided, and the media has played a huge role in that. And I think, you know, as a community, we need to take responsibility for it. It, for, yeah. it makes for good storylines, unfortunately. Yeah. And, you know, but, and, I, and I attribute a lot of this back to, um, back to 60 Minutes back in the 70s when they had uh, uh, Jack Kilpatrick and Shayna Alexander, who... Um, and Saturday Night Live made a, made a cottage industry out of, out of making fun of uh, 60 Minutes and Jack Kilpatrick and Shane Alexander uh, calling each other, you know, bitch this and that. They didn't actually use those terms. But they, they were really, they really went at it. And apparently, unfortunately, people kind of go for that kind of stuff. They go for that, that at the throat kind of discussion mm -hmm. rather than cogent, reasonable, mm -hmm. honest, Communication between, and just delivering information and not so much editorial, right? And, yeah. and that's really where I find the issue today is that we reserve editorial to the editorial page, <laughs> and like an article should be about the information given. Yeah, yeah. You know, and um, and we find that we do that in the Tribune. That's what we partner with. The, like I said, with Connecticut Mirror, there's an ethnic newswire that's called New America Media New that America we, Media. we also pull okay. from, and that's out of California. And they actually, what they do, it's a compilation of ethnic newspapers from around the country that have different viewpoints or different stories. Um, 
And we go out and we do the stories ourselves. We have a beautiful series, it's called The American Dream. And we feature an immigrant from the community and we tell their story. Like, what was your American Dream? How did you get here? And how did this happen for you? And to have that in three languages and to have that person share that with their children but at the same time, show it to their boss, you know, show it to their coworkers. Maybe their, their English is not at that level yet to explain that story that deeply. And they got to talk to us in their, in their Portuguese or Spanish and share the story at a vocabulary level that meant something for them and then have that access in English and share it with the community. So Really not that much different than my grandparents mm -hmm. in 1906 coming here. They spoke a little bit of English, but their principal language was Gaelic. Mm -hmm. And um, they, they struggled, mm -hmm. but they were working on an estate, so they, they, a lot of their work was um, hand stuff, so it really wasn't... Mm -hmm. I don't want to say rocket science because, because mm -hmm. working with your hands can be just as difficult as rocket scientist. No disrespect to rocket scientists. <laughs> but, um, but it's very similar to what they went through, except they didn't have to go through all this stuff about worrying about being deported. Right, but they, were I think, they were comfortable. But, they would, but I think like, if I look at you know, the history of, of Irish immigrants, mm -hmm. there was, I think there was a lot more violence towards um, people of, of the Irish community. In there, the cities, you know, yeah. you know what I mean, you know, so everyone went through something. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I think it's really the same story under a different sun looked at a different angle because yeah. every, I think every community had a major challenge. The really sad part of the story is that the communities that, that have gone through it and um, welcomed the new ones are not trying to stop the cycle of the oppression, right? They're sometimes they're actually the ones inflicting the same kind of sentiment. And that's really the conversation we should have because, um, you know, how do we then understand that our ancestors weren't treated fairly at times and why are we going to perpetuate that onto another community now if we know that that was a detriment to their advancement, you know, and that hurt them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that caused a lot of Irish mothers to say, don't speak Gaelic at home, mm -hmm. just speak English. Uh, they lost their language. My ex-wife right, Diane, whose parents came here from Czechoslovakia. Mm -hmm. And the first thing they did was they decided that, that only English would be spoken in the household. And years later, their children grew up and they worried, they were, oh, you know, we really should have had our kids learn to speak their native language. Yeah, and, and now that story is told like, oh, we really want to be Americans. But no, there was so much stigma mm -hmm. that they did not want to speak any other language other than um, you know, English. It wasn't because just because now we're going to romanticize and say, oh, we were so proud. There was some of that, but really came from we don't want to be different because it's not good. <laughs> and that leads <laughs> you know, to a like, tremendous loss of culture. It does. And, and it's a loss for all of us, right, when we lose that culture. And um, I'm so glad my mom, I came when I was 10 years old. And I'm so glad she stuck to Portuguese and told me that I had to learn it and I had to read and write in it. We're going to continue the discussion as we fade out. So, so follow with this if you have. If, if you missed some of that we're discussing after the, uh, after the credits come on, sorry. You should have been here. It's but good. Continue, continue. continue. <laughs> but, you know, it's been, it's been very, it's been very um, interesting, this whole process. It has. It has. And it's, and it's good to have you on the show. And I was looking forward to this very I know. Much. There was a lot of, um, you know, meeting up and, and not being able to schedule it, but I'm blessed. Here we are. Thanks I'm glad for joining we got us. it done. Yes. Yes. So much.